I want to ask you to turn to Galatians chapter 5 this morning, but just to put a finger in there, uh, find Galatians 5, put a finger in it, and then please turn to John's Gospel chapter 10, which is the page number that you'll see printed, page 896, that's John's Gospel chapter 10, that's our main reading, but in just a moment uh, we'll come back to Galatians 5. We're in a series looking at the fruit of the Spirit, this morning goodness, Uh, this morning's sermon perhaps slightly different with new members. I want us to look at a passage that touches on what it means to be shepherds of sheep, to be sheep with shepherds who know them, and all of it, I pray, all of it I pray leading us to Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Here is where we see ultimate goodness. John's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 1, the Lord Jesus is speaking, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this, this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, how wonderful, how beautiful, how amazing. He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our shepherd, in these moments, may we listen and hear your voice above all other voices. In these moments, may we listen and be led by you above all others. And in these moments, may we walk through the door, you, our door, to find eternal life and pasture forever with you, our friend, our shepherd, our savior, our king. So may it be, amen. Churches can be some of the most dangerous places on earth. Have you ever thought about that? I would wager that some of you here this morning know that. 
Some of us here this morning know that. Churches can be some of the most dangerous places on earth. In churches you meet thieves, robbers, hired hands, and you can come face to face with wolves. And all of them can leave you broken and bleeding. Look at chapter 10, verse 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Look at verse 12. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and abandons them to the wolf, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. See what the Lord Jesus is saying to us this morning. You are a sheep. I am a sheep. We belong to Jesus. And as we do so, we will come up against leaders who fleece us. Leaders who abandon us. Leaders who let us leave and wander away without ever coming after you. It's true, isn't it, that many Christian people carry deep scars, not from the suffering inflicted on them by the world, but the suffering they have experienced at the hands of a shepherd or at the teeth of another sheep. I want you to just flick forward to Galatians chapter 5. Like I asked, Galatians chapter 5, put your eyes on verse 15. What kind of fellowship was the Galatian church? Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. Keep your finger in John 10. We'll come back there in just a moment. What kind of fellowship was the Galatian church? Have you ever heard people say, we should get back to the early church? If only we could be like the early church. Galatians 5, 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Here was a group of believers, friends, the Galatian church that knew all about badness in church. Look at chapter 6, verse 10, or verse 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Good, the fruit of the Spirit, goodness. For in due season we will reap if, if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The Galatian Christians like us this morning needed to be told to do good to one another. But, but the goodness we can do, the best goodness that we can ever do to one another, it comes from the life of Christ being formed in us. Just look back at Galatians 4 verse 19. This has been perhaps the foundational verse, hasn't it? As we've worked through the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says to the Galatians 4.19, My little children... For whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Brothers and sisters, this morning, we will never have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. We will never have that without Christ Himself giving us His life and growing His life in us. It's why we've turned occasionally to look at the Lord Jesus Himself as we think about the fruit of the Spirit. I want us today to look at ultimate goodness, perfect goodness, Christ's goodness. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said to a man once? No one is good but God alone. And all of the goodness that is in God, friends, it is in the Lord Jesus as well. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan theologian, said this, Christ is the greatest good, the choicest good, the chiefest good. Christ is the most suitable good, the most necessary good. Christ is a pure good, a real good, a total good, an eternal good, and a soul-satisfying good. So friends, today, on a, on a day for new members on a day for sheep and for shepherds. I want us to look at why the Lord Jesus is good. It's what he calls himself twice in that passage, isn't it? So beautifully. I am the good shepherd. There is no goodness we can ever consider that is not found ultimately in him. And in John chapter 10, Jesus is speaking this. This whole chapter is a stinging rebuke to the Pharisees. Look at the last verse of 
chapter 9. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We can see, your guilt remains. The Pharisees are blind shepherds. Shepherds who have been charged with looking after God's people, the people of Israel. Charged with being put over them to care for them and love them and lead them. And Jesus says, you can't even see one foot in front of the other. If you can't see, how can you possibly lead my people? They've come face to face now with Jesus, the light of the world. And they've tried to get their sheep not to listen to Jesus. And they're about to try and snuff out the light of Jesus. And friends, all over the world... I wonder if you know this, all over the world today there are shepherds like this. Do you know why that's so wicked, so awful, so dangerous? Because the sheep pen, the fold, the flock, the church is in fact meant to be the safest place on earth. Look at verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Look at verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I, I, I was thinking, is there any better emotion in all the world than feeling safe? Is there anything better than feeling safe? Maybe there is, but it, it's hard to beat, isn't it? The child who knows it at night. The child who cries out, are, are you there, Dad? Are you there, Mom? And, and for us, it's the same, isn't it? You see, the, the safety the shepherd gives, it's not so much a boundary wall around us. It's not so much a boundary wall as it is a garden that he gives us to graze in. Verse 9. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Churches should give you pasture, life, health, wholeness. Pasture is a beautiful word. It's more than just eating to survive, isn't it? Like, like a battery hen. No, it's, it's a free-range word, a roaming word. Everything that you need to thrive given to you. Shepherds should give you those things. And so what I want to show us from these verses is just two things this morning two things that bad shepherds do and why Jesus our good shepherd does the opposite and they're both to do with his death Jesus is the shepherd who dies and I want you to stay with me this morning as we think about shepherds while we're thinking about goodness as a fruit of the spirit we'll come back to that at the end two things to see number one bad shepherds lay down the life of the sheep for the shepherd but the good shepherd dies for the sheep. Bad shepherds lay down the life of the sheep for the shepherd. But the good shepherd reverses it and lays down his life for his sheep. And then secondly, much more briefly, bad shepherds scatter the sheep, but the good shepherd gathers the sheep. Bad shepherds scatter, the good shepherd gathers. So here's the first thing to see. Bad shepherds lay down the life of the sheep for the shepherd. But Jesus dies for his sheep. I don't, I don't mean to be personal this morning, but I want to ask, have you ever met a fat shepherd? I want to introduce you to the fat shepherds in the Bible. Just turn back to the book of Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, page 722. Again, keep a hand in John 10. Or only a quick moment in Ezekiel 34, page 722. When Jesus speaks in John's Gospel, chapter 10, there is a backstory to what he's saying. Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. Shepherds 
laying down the life of the sheep for the shepherd. I like what you have, sheep. I like what you can do for me. I'll take some of that for myself. Shepherds lay down the life of the sheep when they put their own needs before the needs of the people, when they use ministry to serve themselves. And it happens, friends. It really, really happens today. The wealthy minister, but the poor people. But here's the main way it happens. When shepherds do not protect the sheep from all the things that will kill their spiritual life. That's what God is upset about here. That is what the Lord Jesus is upset about. When shepherds do not protect the sheep from spiritual harm. And to protect sheep in that way, to lay down your life for the sheep rather than laying down the life of the sheep for you, will demand the life of the shepherd. I mean, think about it. I think we would react with horror, wouldn't we? Imagine you, you, you woke one morning to news of a break-in and a robbery in a house down the road. And what you were reading on your news feed was that in the middle of the night, the father and the family in the dead of night heard a noise downstairs and he went down one level and woke his daughters and told them, there's someone downstairs, go and get them. I think there's somebody in the house. Children, go and see who it is. And the father retreated upstairs and waited for news. A father or a mother who know the house is on fire and who get themselves out, but who leave the two children upstairs. Friends, today, up and down the land, the sheep are handed to the wolves of the flesh, the world, and the devil by shepherds who will not shed their blood to protect the sheep, by leading them to the voice of Christ in the Scriptures. Oh, friends, that is hard, hard, back-breaking work. To, to, to say to sheep, to say to, to sheep, no, dear sheep, we, we will not do that because that will be harmful. That will lead us away from Christ, dear sheep, if we go down that road. Oh, to say to somebody, oh, precious sheep, don't marry her. Don't, don't marry him. That will lead you away from Christ. Don't sleep with him. Don't watch that. Don't read that. Have you thought of doing this instead? Are you feeding on Christ? He, here's what that will mean as a church if we do A instead of B. Friends, to lead sheep like that hurts and costs. Look at the text with me. What does Jesus say? Jesus the good shepherd he knows the sheep. You could go through this text and put together all the things that Jesus does. He knows the sheep. He speaks to the sheep. He saves the sheep. He protects the sheep. And what the Lord Jesus does, all other shepherds need to do. Elders need to know their flock. Macro knowing. it. It's why we have a membership list. It's so we, we have the macro group. We know who belongs to us and who doesn't. And we need to have micro-knowing. Not just the big group. Elders need to know you personally, individually. The, the title of elder is not an office you hold. It's not an office you hold. It is a relationship you nurture. Shepherd to sheep. Elders speak to the sheep, speak Christ's words to the sheep, and elders protect the sheep. And here's how they do it. Listen to this. Listen to this. John Calvin, a famous pastor, a man who knew what it was to give his life to the sheep. He said this, It is the universal duty of all pastors or shepherds to defend the doctrine which they proclaim even at the expense of their own life and to seal the doctrine of the gospel with their own blood. Isn't that amazing? It is the universal duty of all pastors or shepherds to defend the doctrine which they proclaim, even at the expense of their own life, and to seal the doctrine of the gospel with their own blood. And then he says this. You think that's high? And then he says this. It must be held that a pastor 
ought to prefer his flock or even a single sheep to his own life. It must be held that a pastor ought to prefer his flock or even a single sheep to his own life. Think about that. I think it's true. I think it's beautiful. But think about it. Many sheep move on, don't they? Because they find their shepherd, I don't know, take your pick, annoying, boring, too hard, or the elders too soft. They don't do this, they don't do that. And the sheep move on. But think about it. There's usually, what, one minister, five elders, handful of elders, ten elders, and what? A hundred sheep, two hundred sheep, three hundred sheep. That's a lot of people for the shepherds to find annoying and difficult, demanding, stubborn, proud. And so many ministers move on. It must be held that a pastor ought to prefer his flock or even a single sheep to his own life. Oh, friends, churches should be the safest place on earth. Here in this place, you should be known by name. Fed Christ's living word week by week, year by year, and patiently protected to the death. To the death. I think older pastors tend to know this best. Here's one older pastor, a man called John Flavel. He said this, A prudent minister will study the souls of his people more than the best books in his library and not choose what is easiest for him, but what is most necessary for them. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't you like John Flavel as your pastor? Meetings are many. Admin is necessary. Committees are required. Yes, but men who study the souls of their people. Uh, that, that's a shepherd. Men who love you and who come after you and say, we haven't seen you for a while. Is everything okay? Where are you with Christ, our good shepherd? Now, now why do we do it? Why do we try and do it? Well, John 10, because of what the Lord Jesus does for us. All of us. Jesus dies for his sheep. Bad shepherds lay down the life of the sheep for the shepherd, but Jesus, well, look at verse 11 again. Here is the definition of goodness. I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 15, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Friends, here is why churches are places of safety. The greatest kind of safety in the world. Because in here, and only in here, we learn that we are sheep who need a Savior. We like to think of ourselves, everybody else out there will tell us we're strong. We're, we're wise, we're independent, we're, we're captains of our own souls, masters of our own destiny, right? And along comes the Bible. And all the way through Israel's history, God describes himself as a shepherd and his people as sheep. Why? Because from the Garden of Eden onwards, we show ourselves to be the kind of creatures who follow other voices we shouldn't follow, who wander places we shouldn't wander to, who get lost in places where we really need to be found. I, 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 I would choose, I don't know, tiger lion. I'm a bear. What does the Bible say? No, you're dependent, vulnerable, wayward, weak, willful. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned each one to his own way. It's what we do, isn't it? And Jesus says, I came to lay down my life for those sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, the shepherd, the, the iniquity of the sheep. I am a sheep. I need a bleeding shepherd. You know, think about the problems that greeted you this morning, the world news in Israel yesterday, whatever else it is that has come our way these past 
past 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever we think the greatest problem in the world is, it is not the nuclear button on Vladimir Putin's desk. It's not the cost of living or whatever it is, the cost of oil. That the greatest problem in the world today is that today is one more day of the Lord's patience before the great and terrible day of the Lord. When the books will be opened and all the evils in the world that we cannot account for and cannot put right, God will put right. What did Jesus say when He, the shepherd, will separate the sheep and the goats forever? Oh, bad shepherds lay down the life of the sheep for the shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I want to finish with this, the second point, number two, much more briefly. Much more briefly, bad shepherds scatter the sheep, but Jesus gathers the sheep into one. See, in chapter 9, there is an incredible instance of scattering. Look at chapter 9, verse 34. Here is a man born blind who Jesus has healed. And do the Pharisees love that? Do they want to include him, inviting him along to the next house group, wanting him to become a member of church, drawing him in? They answered in verse 34, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. One of Christ's sheep. There's the door. Leave. Bad shepherds scatter. Good shepherds gather. And as Jesus dies for his sheep, look, look what he says, verse 15. Chap- chapter 10, verse 15. As he dies for his sheep, his sheep in the Jewish fold. Verse 15. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And the sheep of the Gentile fold. Verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. That that is every other group outside of Israel. That is you and me this morning that the Lord Jesus is talking about in verse 16. His other sheep not of this Jewish fold are His people throughout all the earth who He will die for and gather. Men and women from every tribe and tongue and nation of the globe. And he does for them and calls them and knows them. He does for them what they cannot do for themselves. And as he does that, look what he says. Verse 16, he gathers them into one. There will be one flock, one shepherd. Arab, Scot, Croat, Irish, American, Inuit. And where Jesus has His sheep, He has one flock. And there is one shepherd. Friends, we confessed it together this morning. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one holy, catholic, apostolic church. In the Nicene Creed, Catholic means universal. One universal church. Do you know how Jesus does that? How does He take Jew and Gentile and make them one? How does He make you and I one with people in New Zealand this morning, or China, or West Hill? Our shepherd does that for His sheep by dealing with our greatest danger. The greatest obstacle to safety we have, which is our sin and our rebellion against God. All sheep have one shared problem our iniquity. There is black guilt, white guilt, Asian guilt, Scottish guilt, because it is human guilt. The shepherd pays for the one thing that unites us all, and therefore he removes every other single thing that divides us. Here is where we connect to the fruit of the Spirit, and the goodness of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Well, friends, the greatest good in the world is that we are His. And because I am His and you are His, there can be no barrier between you and me. None. You'll have had this too. We've had it in our home from time to time uh, through some strange mechanism. People come to stay who you have never met before. 
friend of a friend, could you look after this person? Whatever it is that happens, you've, you've never even heard their name. You're helping them. You're, they're here for something else. And this person is a Christian. They step off the plane. They come to your house. They open the door. You give them a room for, your, for the night. They sit at your kitchen table beside you. And what do you say to them? Welcome, brother. Welcome, sister. You've felt that, haven't you? You've known it, some of you. You've gone to the other side of the world, stepped off a plane with people you have never met, and immediately you know you are at home with family. We are one. I want to say to you this morning, friends, brothers and sisters, you belong to Christ's church before you belong to Trinity Church. Some of you will be here for the rest of your lives. Some of you for weeks, months, years, and then off. You belong to Christ's church before you belong to Trinity. Christ is your shepherd before I am or any other shepherd here. Christ's church through Christ's death is the thing that makes us one. Christ's death on the cross, listening to his voice, being led by him, staying near his side, keeps us one. You see, that's why goodness in your heart this morning and in mine is a fruit of the Spirit. What does Paul say in Galatians? If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Galatians 5.15, do you know what comes immediately before that? Verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. One word, love, love. Brothers and sisters, goodness is not niceness. Goodness is not niceness. Goodness is learning to love you the way that Jesus loves me. And learning to love you means laying down my life for you. Because Jesus has made me one with you. I want to, I want to encourage you very practically. This will happen to some of you this week. To some of us it will happen in the next weeks or months ahead. You will sit across the table from another believer with whom you are in conflict. And someone has said something or done something or upset you or you've upset, upset, upset them and you're sitting across from another believer and there is a wall between you, a wall of emotion, a wall of pain, a wall of hurt. I want to encourage you this morning, so to the Spirit in that morning, not the, in that moment, not the flesh. In that moment, plant a seed of shepherd-like, Christ-like goodness by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's so simple. It's so hard. It's the goodness that comes from knowing Christ who loves us like this. We sometimes talk about diversity in a church, don't we? In a church family, male, female, old, young, students all the differences that we have to overcome to be one. But those are not the real things that separate us from each other, are they? No, we have, we have much greater diversity. Single child parents, people parent differently in single child families from multi-child families, extrovert, introvert, different temperaments, different types of health, different types of wealth, different politics, pro-independence, anti-independence, state school, private school, and on a hundred other issues we are all across the spectrum and the Lord Jesus takes us all and makes us one one bad shepherds scatter bad shepherds say to people you're different from us you don't really belong here I think you should try the church up the road Bad shepherds say, you, you can be thrown to the wolves. Go, go and wander somewhere else and look for teaching for food. Good shepherds gather. Come in here. Welcome here. Be fed here. Be clothed here. Listen, learn, grow together. Brothers and sisters this morning, may Trinity be a place. Here, here is our prayer. A place of good pasture. For all of us. May Trinity be a good door for us. May it be a place where good under shepherds, as sheep themselves, lead other sheep whom we know and love and lead you to Christ, the good shepherd. 
all our days. Amen.